Welcome, we're live right here at SEMA 2014 at the beautiful SEMA stage, and I'm standing next to my friend, Gentleman Joe Schubeck. How are you doing today, sir? Great, Dennis, great, great. How does a guy get a name like Gentleman Joe? Oh, I was hoping you wouldn't ask me that. <laughs> that, uh, that goes back to the, my childhood. My, I guess my mother was, she always taught me, she says, you know, when you're out with a lady, you got to open the car door, and, and when you're in a restaurant, you got to put the chair under, you know, you got to act like, like you had some training, you know, and so I've always done that. When I was at a drag race event in the Midwest, this, this drag news writer, Ben Brown, he was uh, there covering the event, and he's looking at me opening up the car door for his girlfriend of mine, you know, and we were in a restaurant, and I was doing that, and he says, you know, he doesn't seem like a drag racer. He seemed like a real gentleman, like a college professor or something, you know. Since we really kind of, uh, just, I, I don't see any of these other guys doing this kind of stuff. So anyway, it, uh, it was something I tried to sweep under the rug because I thought it was kind of corny. And, uh, but I, I told Escondarian about it, and Ed Escondarian says, aha, I got something just for you. And he had a hot top hat that he was saving uh, for a few years, and he says, see if this fits, and he blunked that hat down on, 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 the, on his arm, and it went whoop, <laughs> and he put it on, and it fit, and he says, hey, we're going to make something out of this, and, and he painted up my car with all the Gentleman Joe stuff, and, and Mickey Thompson thought it was a good idea, and Escondarian's ads in the drag news would say, Gentleman Joe from Cleveland, Ohio is coming out to California with his esky powered Chrysler dragster looking to take on all comers from Lions drag strip. You know, it was Mickey Thompson liked that because he was another storyteller. Those, between oh, yeah. Esky and Mickey Thompson, they were the greatest uh, creator, creative writers ever that I've ever known. Anyway, that's kind of a long story short, but it was uh, something that I never could get rid of, and I think it's kind of nice. Well, there's nothing wrong with mom teaching you right. That's what I would have said. My <laughs> right mom on. taught me right to open the door. Yeah. Um, yeah. You, you and I have had a, a little bit of a connection. I was lucky enough to work for Hot Rod Magazine for a while, and you have some great history with Mr. Peterson, and I always refer to him as Mr. Peterson. I was never lucky enough to meet the man, but you have had some great history with Hot Rod Magazine and everything going on there. When I was... Uh, I think 13 years old and living in Lakewood, Ohio, outside of Cleveland. That, those were real cold winters and the snow on the ground. And my friend Dewey and I, we used to go up to the delicatessen and we'd get the Hot Rod magazine and we'd read it and then we'd reread it and read it from back to front, front to back. And we do everything. <laughs> we thought we were the best engine builders going in our minds. And so we, um, my, my desire was to be a drag racer one day and, and, and build one of those cars like they were racing on the West Coast and, and even go out to the West Coast sometime and, and, and race with them. But it was really a distant dream. It was like going to Mars. <laughs> you made so, it though. Yeah, you gotta be careful what you wish for. <laughs> so that, that kind of uh, the drag racing experience started for me when I was in Cleveland because I ran into a guy by the name of Jack Harris who just happened to have a, a dragster almost all finished and built, but he, he had his mind set on being in the speed business. And Rush Sales was the name of the company. So I took over that car. And see, the difference between back then and now when you're going dragster racing is that you had to be everything. You had to be the welder. You had to put the tires together. You had to build the engine. You had to paint the car. You had to put make the rear end and, and, and do all the linkage. And, and then between doing all that, you had to be on the phone calling the strip operator to see if you can get some money to go out there, you know. So it was, uh, you had to be a painter. I mean, it was, nowadays you gotta, uh, um, the teams have a, a bottom end guy. They got a guy for blowers. They got a guy, you know how that goes. Yeah, yeah. So it's a little richer, but back then there wasn't any money and it was really a, a bare bones deal, but it was a lot of fun. If you had to summarize your incredible career from beginning to end, what, what would be the one memory that might stand out among others? Oh boy, there was so many great times and all that when all that happened back there. I'll tell you the, the worst time. Let me just turn that around a minute. The, the, the worst time I ever had, the worst decision I ever had to make was uh, I had built 
dragster chassis to pay for the fuel to go traveling with. And while I was doing all that processing, I, I came across the, a process for forming metal called hydroforming. And we took flat disks of metal and we put them in this machine and, and, and it formed these beautiful shapes. And, and we made Lakewood scatter shield out of it and it, and it was a containment for all the shrapnel and the debris coming from flywheels and clutches exploding. Sure. And it was a great thing. Well, Jack Harris, the guy that sponsored me into drag racing, now with a big distribution speed shop, said, better get out of that dragster. We've got orders. We can sell thousands of those bell housing scatter shields. And I was making about two a month. <laughs> so I thought, he says, you got to get out of there. And I says, you mean, do you mean quit drag racing? And he says, yeah. yeah. You don't want to do that. You got to go into big some make some money. You're setting down a million dollar product here. And I says, "Oh, I'm not going to quit drag racing, you Jack. You can't stop, you can't stop racing. Bad. Forget the whole thing." So he said, "Well, I'll tell you what. I'll help you out. I'm cutting you off as your sponsor." <laughs> so That's that good. started. I'm thinking, "Oh, no more money at all." Huh. So uh, I did that, and uh, it wasn't. It wasn't six months later. Boy, we were putting skins of scatter shields on out the door and trucks and money was coming in and wheelbarrows full and I'm thinking boy this isn't so bad at all I could build five dragsters now and sponsor myself but I didn't want to do that anymore because I was kind of in a race for another another kind of race you know and and I was still involved a little bit with racing but I was not now involved with all the higher echelon of uh, uh, the high performance industry which was you know the the Edelbrocks, the Escandarians, and all the and yeah. the Petersons, and and I was kind of over in that camp and went and hanging out with those people, the manufacturers, and then of course got into SEMA and I was on the board of directors. I couldn't help listening to Leo Kagan just a while ago. He was telling about how he had to really wrestle with the board of directors to get the SEMA show out of Anaheim because it wasn't going to be big enough and it needed to grow, and so. And I, I'm sitting down there and I'm listening, and he finally got convinced. I was on that board of directors. Wanna, you want to hear some of the real negatives of why that? Oh, no, should, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe we here, should, we here, should I'll just the tell you one. Okay. We don't want to go to Las Vegas because all the buyers, all the buyers from all over the East Coast are going to be coming out there with bags of money to buy products and they're going to lose it all on the casino's crap tables. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why we shouldn't go. Well, but, it, still, it still worked out for everybody. You know, oh, the, you know the best part, gentlemen, Joe, yeah. is whether it was good times, bad times, or rough times, or yeah. just going down the quarter mile, you always kept that hat and you always kept that smile. And we thank you so much for coming up on the SEMA Central stage. Thank you <laughs> thank so you. much. And you, uh, don that hat because that's yeah. your signature. Fabulous. More fabulous. coming up right here, SEMA Central 2014 SEMA. We'll see you soon. And there it is. I shot Sherry.